Hi, good evening, everyone. I'm Gretchen Rumor Voskel. I'm chair of the English department, and it is my uh, joy and pleasure to um, to welcome you to our final uh, Contemporary Writers Series event of the season. Um, before we get started, I wanted to point out who will be visiting us next year for our Contemporary Writers Series. So um, all of these events take place on a Thursday. And on um, September 26, we will be welcoming young adult author and uh, contemporary poet Benjamin Alira Science. Um, he will be reading from, uh, from his young adult fiction as well as his contemporary fiction and poetry. Uh, we'll be welcoming Kathleen Dean Moore, uh, who writes creative nonfiction and fiction on November 7th. On February 13, we will be welcoming Thisbe Neeson and J. Baron Nakoro. Um, who write fiction. And then to close out our season, we'll be having Christopher Merrill, who directs the International Writing Program at University of Iowa. He's a poet, nonfiction writer, and translation expert. And he will come on April 16. So we're really excited about uh, next season's lineup as well. Also, before I give my formal introduction, I want to make sure that I recognize the efforts of one very important person who's been key to the success of our committee, and that is Vicki McMillan, who's sitting in the back. Um, Vicki will be retiring this year, so this is her last formal. Her last formal contemporary author series event. She's been part of this committee since its beginning. And um, we are so grateful for all of the work that she has done um, to advocate for this committee and to bring top notch authors and, uh, to this campus and to show them hospitality. So thank you, Vicki, for all of your great work. So um, I spent a fair amount of time in the late summer and the fall seeking the water. And our Writing Center director, Julie Bevins, can attest that every walk meeting, which we take quite often, that we had, it ended at Reed's Lake. Nearly every day, I saw Lake Michigan, the Grand River, or even the wildlife-rich wetlands along my running route. I tell people these days, there is something about water that reminds me who I am and whose I am. And now, as the big lake has thawed and the geese have returned to our campus ponds to drink and eat and nest, we welcome Allison Swan. Swan is a professor at Western Michigan University, an environmental activist, and a solitary and collaborative writer. Many of her efforts focus on our Great Lakes, especially in relation to the Saugatuck Dunes. Swan's writing has gotten notable attention. Freshwater, Women Writing on the Great Lakes was a 2007 Library of Michigan notable, notable book. She has also received the Mesa Refuge Writers Fellowship and the Michigan Environmental Council's Petoskey Prize for Environmental Leadership. As Swan says, land in the water that turns land into watersheds remain ex inexhaustible sources of resilience. And her ongoing work is a reminder, a celebration, a testament, and sheer advocacy for sustainability. Allison, thank you for your important work here in the state of Michigan and beyond. And I'm going to welcome Kirsten uh, to give the student welcome. Thank you. Hi, everyone. As a native Michigander, I spent most of my childhood walking through the forests that run alongside the Manistee River. On frequent visits to the UP, I would always set down my book as soon as we crossed the Mackinac Bridge, so I could gaze at the expansive waters of Lake Huron as they merged with Lake Michigan. I'm sure everyone in this audience, whether you grew up in Michigan or relocated here yesterday, has similar memories. Allison Swan works to capture the beauty of our home state. Like the colorful fall leaves, my sister, father, and I would press between large books. Swan takes small wonders and preserves them. Reading Swan's poetry, for me, is like returning home to the Manistee River. It is nostalgic and succinct, sweet, wild, and a little unpredictable. Her poetry reminds us to slow down and notice the little things, from life growing in city sidewalk cracks to rocks on the great Michigan shore. Swan's lovely poems and essays also serve as a warning. The environmental degradation facing our world also faces our Great Lakes. 
From invasive zebra mussels to the continually changing climate, the beauty we know will not last forever. Swan's poems, then, are also a call to action. It is not enough to love the lakes. We must also save them. We must activate to preserve the places that we love. I'm so excited to welcome poet, activist, and Michigander, Allison Swan, to the Contemporary Writer Series. Wow. Thank you, Kirsten. I'm not going to try to pronounce your last name. I'll say it wrong. But thank you so very much. Um, and I also have to begin by thanking um, Julie Bevins and Gretchen Rumer Voskel and Shelley Rashafer. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me here. And Vicki McMillan, did I remember that right? Thank you as well. Um, I am so honored to be here in this room with you tonight. I mean, you, you guys, it's kind of nice out. And I mean, it, you know, it got a little nice. And um, you're in here with me. And I'm in here with you. And thank you. I appreciate it. I'm grateful for the sacrifice that um, you're making being in here under a ceiling when you could be outside under the sky. Um, I am, I, some of you have heard me say this before, but I say it almost every time I get to do something like this. I really, really enjoy being in a room full of people willing to pause for poetry. It's just, it's, thank you. So I am going to, um, I'm going to read about, it should only take me about an hour and a half to read what I want to read. Kidding. You're so polite. Thank you. Um, I'm going to read two sets of poems. The first group will be po published poems, and I will make some remarks about them. And, um, and then the second group of poems are from a manuscript I finished last fall. And um, we'll, we'll see what happens in between. I'm really happy to answer your questions. And I'm a little bit tempted to say, you know, right in the middle of things, if you really want to, if you have a burning desire to ask a question, just Raise your hand, but we'll just go. We'll go. We'll go with it, and but know that I am really happy to read my poems to you, and I'm also really happy to answer your questions. So I need a drink of water. I'm going to begin, um, and this is. In the honor of Kirsten, actually, I'm going to begin with a poem that celebrates the landscape of the Saugatuck Dunes. And it would be really hard for me to overstate the significance of the Saugatuck Dunes in my life. Um, I feel so grateful to have been able to spend as much time as I have spent in those dunes. I have been known to say that I know them better than I know the backs of my own hands. And I think that's probably true. Who wants to spend time looking at the back of your own hands, right? And the Saugatuck Dunes draw my gaze over and over. So the first poem is called Before the Snow Moon. And it's true. Everything that I describe in the poem really happened. Before the snow moon. Frozen lagoon blown clear by real wind. We simply sat on the ice to lace our skates. No matter that the enclosing dunes were modest, we were tucked in among mountains. On the other side, someone's beagle wailed. From the under reconstruction lighthouse and the ice cold great lake rolled, silent with somnolent fish. A bitter northeasterly carried highway rumble, and the opaque ice sang deeply. I set my boots on two century-old pilings to keep them out of the snow. What ships bumped up against these century-old pilings? The same stubs before sand filled the river mouth. What canoeists floated summer days when the shores clicked with frogs? A bald eagle soared in from the north. My eye met the eye turned earthward. All of us flying in our separate ways through the same space, 
watched over by ghosts, certainly. A smudge of brighter then was a gibbous moon, the sunset without fanfare. Light damped down to nearly nothing by ferocious cloud cover. Not five hours later, I was awakened by a great horned owl. I climbed out from under a pile of quilts and went to the window to lift the sash. On the other side of the parking lot, pines old as pilings held old nests up. Twigs of a young black walnut scraped the gutters. Snowflakes ticked against the glass. Cold air carried hoots and soughs across the sill. I climbed back under and kept listening. Some major positive reinforcement for paying attention that day. The next poem I'm going to read is called Language of Field Guides. And I'm, I'm hoping that you guys, if you're the nature people in the room, I'm hoping that you read field guides, like the old fashioned kind books. And um, you just learn so much about the creatures that we share the earth with from browsing around in field guides or, or you know, online. But just s descriptions of natural history that have been written by people who have paid attention and maybe even studied things. Um, that said, I have been known to get a little annoyed at some of the um, some of the language that crops up in field guides that can feel a little bit sexist or forget that there's a, a woman using the guide. Uh, you'll hear that towards the end of this poem. It's in three parts, but it's not long. The language of field guides. One, it's not a bad thing this July gone cool and northern. Our car furrows the water mirages of the interstate and my husband guides the steering wheel, as I've seen yearling horses guided. He'd make love right here on the highway between ditches of sumac, but I flip through radio stations and entertain ghosts hovering like hawks. The last spring thaw uncovered mullen leaves, flat rosettes the frost doesn't kill. Their yellow flowers bloom where mullen grows best, roadsides and construction sites, marks of our restlessness, Waste places, say field guides. Two, in maple and cedar woods bounded by Superior and the Huron Mountains, a mesh of leaves and pure cumulus form a piebald mirror. I promise to return when scarlet droops supplant white bracts as red-edged leaves push the first snowflakes from the clouds. Three, from the overlook, I'll watch butterflies trail each other up and down columns of air, holding the sky. Courtship flight, winks one naturalist. Escape from unwanted suitors, winks another. But, but, but for the butterflies and for me, it's not just that. the dreaded mixed up pages. All right, one more poem that's a little bit on the longer side. And then I'll, I'll switch to mostly shorter poems. Do you all know index card files, boxes, library, catalog card files? Um, and that used to be the way that you would look up books in a library. You would pull out a little drawer and flip through little cards, and somebody had to transcribe the name of every item that was in the library onto a card so that people could look it up. This is, of course, pre-computers. So you, you, I want you to have that image in your head when you hear this poem. It's called Catalog. It's a story, and... Um, it happened, it, it, it's set on a college campus, so I thought I should read it here. Let me get a drink of water. Catalog. Look at her utterly flat-footed on library tile between card catalog files and plate glass windows turned mirror by the night, reflecting row upon row of little wooden drawers with their brass pulls and frames holding wee paper labels marked, for instance, AA, AB. 
Look at the beige linoleum so highly polished it reflects every letter label and her shadow self standing flat-footed imagining she pulls Jude the Obscure from the blue nap pack, tears out a page, then folds it in half, in quarters, then eighths, each crease seeded with words. Look at her, looking at the card catalog files, imagining she curls an index finger under one hook and pulls a drawer open to scores of thumbed cards, every single one hole punched and slipped onto a brass rod anchored to a drawer and joined with a book here under the same roof because capable hands with their capable fingers once held each book and typed an ink record onto paper. This is how we index records of our knowledge, and this is where we arranged it, and this is where she ran into him, finally, and he ran into her, brimming with unuttered words and hauling a knapsack, heavy with papers and books, through the corridor between cards and windows, reflecting the two of them standing right where she was considering flipping a drawer of cards forward and dropping one folded page into the space. Look at her, stopped, knowing the concrete planters outside the windows were growing draw shrubs shrimply, sh simply from dirt and fountain water climbed into air. I'm noticing this from far in the inscrutable future because this is where I was walking and he was walking and she was walking with him and we all stopped together on the polished linoleum in front of the mirrored plate glass and rows upon rows of catalog card files where my whole body relaxed into the same goddamned space he'd left it in over and over. My heart really rather suddenly feeling like a peony bud, my chest too small to hold the blossom it would become. Because when they stopped, he put his hands on her shoulders and his eyes on mine. Look at us three, standing next to the calling cards of countless books, packed into dark wooden boxes. The page from Jude, almost left in the one that happens to be the one that is never opened again. My fingers already preparing to stop a certain kind of touching forever alongside an index of practically everything important that's already been read. When you live in the Midwest, um, you can kind of lose track of the suffering that happens in other parts of the country due to fire. And I was just feeling so distant from the California wildfires one year and just started trying to imagine what it would be like to be there and to lose things. And I, the poem I've written about that reflection, I fear, I. I'm nervous that it doesn't do justice to the human suffering that those fires cause. But I'm going to read it in hopes that um, it, maybe, it maybe bears witness in some way that one can bear witness from the middle of the Great Lakes. It's called Fire. Our trees ignite. Every year it happens. On another side of the continent, it's houses and everything within and among that couldn't be carried or wasn't. Mattresses, blankets, baby photos, security systems, soil, house plants, new leaves. When the conflagration ebbs, the earth will lie scorched as winter, at least the sort we have here, where we'll rake and blow things on to frozen. Snow will cover over everything for sleep until the gray blackens because it's soil and everything's about to grow again. You begin to see the limits of metaphor. I awaken every day celebrating, unwilling or unable to write elegies for all the beauty we will surely lose. There is so much we won't. And in our desire to appear clever and unsurprised, we might cease to see it all. So rather, our trees are flooded with the same colors as always, colors masked by summer's green riot and the way sunlight enters earth. 
Our leaves prepare to stop being leaves, but not to stop being litter, then soil, then house plants, babies, mattresses, burglar alarms, the imperfect confection of a house. I'm going to take you across the street, across the state, to the place where I grew up, um, which is Metro Detroit, and read a short poem. Um, and I thought for the writers in this room, it might be fun for you to know that this poem was written over the course of about 20 years. And um, the first inspiration for the poem happened in the 1990s when I heard a seventh grade boy interviewed about working in an urban farm in San Francisco. And the interviewer asked him what he had learned from the experience and he said, I learned asphalt isn't forever. I wrote that on a piece of paper, I put it on my bulletin board. And then a long time later, I saw a documentary about urban farming in Detroit and a gentleman who lives in a Detroit neighborhood where livestock was kept, raised, um, said something. And when you hear it in the poem, you'll recognize his voice. Detroit. Scrub and brush reassert grow. After so much assembly, so much undone. I learned asphalt isn't forever. He was 12, and I was dragging decades of concrete behind me without even realizing. Drop them then. Tear them up and plant vegetables in a parking lot. Goats and chickens behind the last house standing. Totally illegal, but no one complains. He was probably 40-something. What's there to complain about? And Eastern Market fills up with flowers and 100,000 people. My daughter's first word was leaf. I'm kind of proud of that, I have to say. I mean, I, what did I have to do with it, right? But it was her first word. And um, I would like to read you the poem that begins with that word. And the poem is called, beginning with my daughter's first word. And it's a found poem. Every word in here was lifted out of a book. I didn't write a single one. Um, it's from a book called Autumn by Peter Marchand. And it's just a book about the science of autumn, which is so interesting for Michiganders, right? What happens? Why do the trees turn color? And so on. OK, beginning with my daughter's first word. Leaf sits at the end of a vascular system that extends without interruption through the twig to which it's attached along successfully, successively larger branches through fork after fork down the trunk out the main artery of a twisted and bent root to the smallest root hair probing the soil for moisture and nutrients. As a molecule of water evaporates from the leaf, a tug is felt at the most distant root tip. Leaf is one endpoint of a thread. So poems, newer poems, it's always scary reading newer poems. You know, did you know that? Did you know that even people who've been reading in front of people for years and they get up and read newer poems and it's like they're a beginner poet again and they never wrote a poem that was published before and they feel nervous to be um, sharing something that might not work. Um, but that's what I'm gonna do next. Um, not all of the poems that follow are unpublished, but most of them are. And these are from the manuscript that I finished last fall, toward the end of last fall. It's called, the manuscript is called Passerine. And a passerine often, the, the word passerine often gets interpreted as um, songbird. That's not exactly right. I'm not going to set myself forth as an expert on birds. But a passerine is a perching bird. And um, in preparation for talking to you, I thought, okay, I'm going to get really well informed. So a per a per not just a perching bird, but a perching bird that has three toes forward and one back. Okay, so any bird who's uh, looks like this is passerine. And you will, he what, you will understand why I explained all that when you hear some of the poems, I hope. 
I hope it doesn't seem like that was a useless thing for me to tell you. Um, there are a lot of passerine birds in this manuscript. Okay, so here's another poem that was begun I, maybe even 30 years ago. Um, the first part of it is almost exactly the same as the first time I completed it, and I wrote it after I read a book called The Late Great Lakes by William Ashworth. Anybody familiar with that book? It was published in the late 80s. It was written by a man from Oregon, and I remember thinking, that's just crazy that someone from, we, it took someone from Oregon to come and write the story of the Great Lakes from this perspective, but it did. Now you all know there's the newer book called The Death and Life of the Great Lakes by Dan Egan, who does hail from the Great Lakes Basin. And after I read that book, I knew how to finish the poem. So there, now that is a big spread, right? That's a, takes a, that's a long time to write one, one, two, three, four, five, 15 line poem. Okay, it's called After Reading the Late Great Lakes. The dead gave their best blood to birds. Cardinals, red-winged blackbirds, and the downy woodpecker, red-capped, persistent, extracting food from trees in small portions in every season. Deer browse fairways, medians, and kitchen gardens. More real estate is parceled, so more roads flood fields and woods. Shores erupt in built things that have never held a seed, and city light falls over us like flames. On the beach where waves arrive, caddis larvae gather forest litter into cloaks, then creep almost invisible into fresh water, where fish rise from the bottom and eat what they need and when, a great lake flowing coolly over them and under them and through. Have you ever thought about what Earth looks like from the sun? I started thinking about that one day, and, this, and then this happened. Night train. Because the train whistles, I know I am someplace. The sound becomes a perch in the air where I wait for the sun, which has never known a train's honed wheels on a polished track, except maybe as one of the sounds the earth makes as it marks the Milky Way. I am in a place, I say, and I know it, the same way this glossy crow knows earth and not earth and the tree between. Place to stand and place from which to leap. So absolutely ordinary, we say, as if we know, as if every single one of us knows how to fly and when to fly and where. Think of feather veins and snug skin, matter of fact ongoingness, which is maybe not matter of fact at all. Crows gather and watch or don't watch, hop, fly, or perch with gravity and feet. Things that hold earth and hold us to it. Some of the things that keep us home. This is a rant. This is the, my only rant. Bear with me. This is the title poem, Passerine. Talk about being a tree. How about the guy standing behind the checkout counter at Dunham's, ringing up sporting goods all day, 20 feet from a wall of plate glass doors that admit sun, wind, and the aura of hundreds of tons of vehicles gathered orderly on a sea of asphalt, See, we say, as if, and then walk through it insouciantly, wearing nothing but clothing and jewelry. Where are you most vulnerable? On foot, at a busy intersection, five lanes of traffic you know, speeding in each direction, and not a single light that totally serves walkers. You must strategize and take your chances. Laws have to be passed to give you the right of way. Do not take on a car, I used to say to my beautiful husband in his beautiful body. You will not win. And thus I taught our daughter, who seems to have been born fearing things I have never had a chance to know. Not so much passerine as car. World lured with color and light that serve automobiles, not walkers or standers or ringer-uppers. You know the drill. Stay inside, stay inside, stay inside, unless you're automobile. If you're auto, you already know. 
We're remaking the world for you. We're remaking the world for you and calling it good. Keep the faith. Be patient. We are almost finished. That's the battle cry of a Motor City girl. <clears throat> Drones rattle me. That won't surprise you. Reading Walden under a Thomas Wood painting after hearing the latest news about drones. Sun cool as the moon, moon impassive as mountains, mountains weightless as clouds, clouds still as mud, mud clear as water, water opaque as pebbles, pebbles bright as stars. This is a poem called The Day After the Day After. November 10th, 2016. Rather than send it to a landfill, I carry a leftover dollop outside to the compost pile and scrape it into the heap of leaves. I pass back porch pumpkin and the driveway cairn. Nut flash flits, nut hatch flits from twig to twig in the crown of pawpaw. Sun beats down on all of us, beats us into gold and silver, even stone smoothed millennia ago by river but only here at the surface of satellite Earth. Yesterday, I walked out into the not quite icy dawn, empty handed in bare free feet. Maple straightened up and I waded in. Grace. It has been sub-zero for days and our house is snug, sure, but I feel like I'm freezing. The sky is blue. The snow is blue, too. And if there's green in those evergreens, I don't see it. Winter, a hundred days long. Midwinter, mid Michigan, who doesn't love a cardinal? Something red and quick and loud. How many Februaries have I listened for their song? The birds who have sacrificed so very much more than I float above the trees, even today, when the cold is too cold for school. The cedar hedge scatters sunlight, and I see palm fronds, fuchsia bougainvillea, that even the barest trees are the perches of birds. Their hollow bones make them lighter than air. Their tiny hearts keep us all from freezing. I get to live next door to a new human, and I've watched him wandering around in his backyard and getting to know the world. Um, and I, I'm going to read this poem tonight kind of in honor of him because he just became a big brother. And the poem is called Ground Watchers. Each morning, Arturo wanders his backyard, the grassed and treed rough on the other side of the fence we share, his family and mine. Today I watched him toddle, a single Phoebe, and two soon cardinal, leavened crow caws, I swear were absent from the place where I was born. I have made it this far to perch in a shed, looking out at old outbuildings, train tracks, and a new boy who watches the ground unless he's running. Down the hill, the river flows toward Lake Erie, bits of this place suspended, the leaf Arturo lifted up to his eyes and nose, and the leaf I swept from the walk. What comes back upriver and uphill? And how will Arturo and I recognize it? A fan of feathers across the wings of a great blue heron, its beak, its feet. I was just telling my students yesterday that you may, Great blue herons were not a part of my Michigan childhood. They were not even really a part of my Michigan 20s. They were not even really a part of my Michigan 30s. It's really only been in the last 20 years or so that they've become so commonplace that I don't know that we, like, we should be noticing them, but maybe we're not noticing them as much because they're not such a, such a, they don't feel as much of a surprise as they used to. I am a backpacker. And I spend a fair amount of, I get to spend a fair amount of time far from any parking lot, trailhead, electric light, 
I, f I find this to be one of the great pleasures of being alive on Earth. And I want every human being who comes after me to be able to have the same experience. Um, this is a poem that came out of being in the middle of Olympic National Park after dark. And um, I think that's all I will tell you about this poem. And I am going to read that country is the next poem. I'll read maybe two or three short poems, and then I'll take your questions. Back country. I lie back under a hand-stitched painting of flower blossoms, alone on sheets so white, they light up the dimmed hospital room. I'm afraid. I'm afraid, so I think of loves. Loves invited and loves let go. Especially the biggest love, the love who felt the world first between these legs, the the love who felt the and who just as she began to leave me, a leaving that feels like a light storm, brilliant white light that makes me close my eyes when they should be open, even walking outside in the daytime under the great trees of our neighborhood, trees that were saplings when I was 20, and trees that are saplings now. I've only just begun to consider my limbs, the way they've made a gateway, held my daughter, carried my daughter, the way they have held me up, carried me into an unsettled mountain valley as cold rain turned to snow, then snow cover revealed cougar tracks, walking over them its own kind of coming home to a house big and wild enough, a house that felt as I entered it like a darker kind of storm. I'm just, I'm right now, I'm pausing briefly and making choices. Um, this poem is a response to another poet's poem. And once you hear it, you'll know why I don't say who the poet is. It's called Courage. If you're house cleaning and shake a bat corpse from among your things, please do us all a favor. Carry the little body out of the house and into the wide world. The world that shelters birds and butterflies and bats. The world that animates whatever building you shelter in. Bury the bat in leaves at most. Assume marker or prayer. And then be the tree that's ready to wait for its forest. So this is the, my penultimate poem. I love that word, and I love using it. My penultimate poem that I will read, hopefully not that I will write. And um, the speaker in this poem is not me. Well, actually, the speaker in the poem is maybe me. But the girl in the poem is not me. But I think she might be related to me um, because she comes up when I'm working, when I'm writing. She comes up. She's... I'll read the poem. You'll understand why I said what I just said. The poem's called Superpower. Also, I shouldn't assume you know this. There was an earthquake that we could feel in Sagatuck, um, and was an earthquake. Could you feel it here in Grand Rapids? Did it reach this far? Yeah. Needles or leaves? Living trees go on unfurling them into the sky. The girl on the bicycle thinks of this every time she goes outside. She doesn't understand your fear. She understands the sturdiness of ground, plinth beneath a road that holds bike tires impassively as it holds traffic and trees. Once her big bed shook her awake, it took her a few minutes to realize the dog wasn't there and hadn't shaken. But the bed, absolutely yes. The bed had shaken, the bed had shaken, and then the bed had stopped shaking. And then she'd heard the dog's nails clicking on the oak floor overhead. 
The girl had returned to sleep then, having never even opened her eyes. I'm going to close with a poem called, oh, you know what? I lied. I lied. I'm reading a three-line poem and then a ten-line poem. Three-line poem. This is called Anti-Venom Number One, and I wrote this on November 14th, 2016. I can stare the moon full in the face all night long if I want to. Maybe I will. I didn't. I should have. It, it would have been, it would have been good. It would have been hard, though. So I'm going to close with a poem called Obad. And I have to express my gratitude to Jean Busher Bartlett for making the yellow um, broadside postcard and the green postcard that you have. The, um, this POMO bot is excerpted on the yellow one. And Jean Busher Bartlett is a incredible book artist, fine artist. She paints, she makes, she writes books. She makes books, makes them. She stitches them. She, she's a spectacular um, reimaginer of what a book could be in the world. And um, so thank you, Jean Busher Bartlett. And she would have been here, but she's teaching at Wayne State first thing in the morning, and that was not manageable. Oh, bod. Oh, and the other thing you want to know about this poem is that the number that I name in this poem, I'm not superb at the precision of numbers. But I'm pretty sure that's how many, um, the number that I come up, came up with is how many days you've been alive if you reach the age of 50. Leap year throws off the math, right? So, but it's pretty close. It is good to be mortal, but otherwise flawed, to care and suffer and look out into the lemon light of morning and call it beautiful and feel expectation for the 18,000th, 200th, and 62nd time. That is, all I, that is all I'm going to read. Thank you. Thank you, thank you for your attention. Um, I learned that this, I, I learned, I, I had an additional layer of nervousness because I'm being recorded, which I didn't, I didn't know. Um, so that thus the, I'm sorry. I, it's funny how that impacts something, right? Um, yeah, but it, yeah. But I'm glad it was recorded. That's a beautiful thing. To the, that's a gift to me to have a recording of what I just did. Um, questions. You're sitting there so patiently, and I'm so grateful. But is there anything you would like to ask me about anything? And he'll tell you how this is going to work. Thank you, Daniel. All right, so we got two mics here. Um, if you would like to come up to the mic and not make me run around, that would be appreciated. That'll be right here. Um, otherwise, um, I will be walking around with the mic. Uh, please do not start your question until you have the mic um, in hand, because as she said, we are recording, um, and we do need everything to be on camera and on the audio um, that's connected to the video. So questions are open now. So I, that don't have to be about writing. It can be about the activism. It can be about the Saga Tuck Dunes. Um, and I'll do my best to answer. So <clears throat> in your three-line poem, you gave us a date. November 14th, 2016, mm -hmm. is that right? Mm -hmm. What happened on November 14th, 2016? It was the first full moon after the election. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> and I, I, um, I was out in my backyard, and um, I, the moon was incredible. That It was really bright and clear, and that's really unusual in November. You all know, I don't have to tell anybody here that about November. Thank you for that question. Anything else? Hi again. Here we go. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about your 
process of writing a poem. Um, obviously, you're inspired by very specific things, but once you're inspired, how do you go about like putting that to paper? That's a, that's a fun question and a scary question for most writers to be asked, and we sort of expect it. Um, thank you for asking it, because it, I find in answering it, it helps me to think it through a little bit more every, every time I think about the question. Um, by this point, the process, there is no one process, but you are absolutely right in, in noticing that poems begin with very specific, as in physical objects that my senses engage with and are interested by. It, sometimes it's as simple as that. Um, and what I've developed the habit of doing is spending, I was telling you earlier when we were chatting, that I've developed the habit of spending some time before I do anything at the beginning of the day just being quiet with paper and pen and my thoughts. And I do that because I've learned that if I don't, things that crossed my path in the last 24 hours go away. Um, and so that's when I, I get them down. And if I'm in that, that quiet morning mind where I have not checked the news yet, I haven't talked to anybody in my house if they know it's good for them, I've begun to drink coffee, um, I have beloved books around me, it often it goes past whatever the thing was. And then the really special thing that all, that all writers know is the language begins to play a role. And um, that's about as specific as I can be. Maybe the thing that might be useful to people who are just starting out with writing or newer to it than I am is to make sure that you slow down the process and quiet your mind enough there's nothing efficient about writing poems, thank goodness, right? Um, it's not an efficient thing. It's all about, um, for me, and I'm guessing a lot, a, a lot of writers I know talk about it this way, it's really about a, like going into a different kind of way of being in relationship to your life, really, than almost everything else asks you to do. So it feels really... I joke, and I joke a lot now that I, I feel like I live in a parallel universe a lot of the time. Um, other people like other people describe that as like she's weird or she's crazy or she's and the nice word is eccentric, right? I got guilty as charged, and um, I've joked to some people lately. Oh my gosh, you spend your life writing and reading poems. You just get a little. You get a little. You get a little strange. Um, and then where I go from there is maybe given a whole bunch of what's going on right now, maybe strange is okay. I, I don't know. Maybe it is. I don't know. I'm not going to. It, this, it's just, it is what it is, right? Thanks for that question, though. Anything else? So much for your reading. Um, trying to think of how to phrase this. Um, I'm very interested in writing about the natural world, but I've noticed that it tends to, in contemporary poetry, it tends to have its own category a lot of times, and it's kind of put in the. Or there's certain journals that will just focus on nature poetry. Um, so I wondered if you had thoughts on that um, as you've published and you've um, and the things that you read. Do you feel that? There needs to be more of an intermixing of quote unquote nature poetry or work that's about the natural world and bringing it into more of the mainstream of poetry or is it good that it has its own genre or its own category and its own subgenre? I guess. Um, I'm not sure if I'm making sense. So. You're making perfect sense. Um, I, well, the first thing, you asked a couple different questions. I think that nature, nature poetry, a term I use with a little trepidation, um, poem that engages the living world that's not human, um, land, uh, for landforms, water, bodies of water, ecosystems. Um, why would that be off in its own category? And yet, when it is, then it's highlighted. Um, I don't... I personally would like to see 
everything that I just described, nature, maybe for a short word, I would like to see it more integrated into everything about human life, including our literature. Um, I have noticed that a lot of contemporary books of poems have environmental crises themes in the poems. And what a, a kind of deep anxiety that I have is that we skipped over a part. We, we went from the literary world more or less ignoring the natural world to the little literary world uh, writing elegies. About, and that's just, that's completely wrong because there's still so much of the planet that's wildly alive, right? Um, but yeah, so keep writing those poems. Um, I was just reading an essay by Denise Levertov, who is a, a, an American poet. We, we, we claim her. Um, and she, she was saying that we, even when things feel very grim for those of us who value wild nature, um, we still need poems of praise and celebration. We, we do. They're deeply important right now. Yep. If I can put you on the spot, um, in conversations we've had, I, I know you've said you are not an activist, and every time I hear you read, it seems like it's such activism. So can you talk a little bit about um, your writing life and how um, so much of your writing is? That's my beloved. He absolutely did just put me on the spot. <laughs> he asked me that question in front of all of you. Um, I, I, this, this is my angry face. This is my thinking face. Um, I, so, okay, this is the way I'm going to answer that question. I swing back and forth, and I'm, th I'm guessing there might be people in this room who can relate to this. And I'm, let me describe the swinging. Over here, I'm like, Badass. I don't care who I piss off. I'm mad, and I'm going to talk about it. I'm going to say what I think. And then over here, I just want to like, be in my little shed, looking at Arturo, picking up leaves, and checking them out, thinking about the great blue hair. And, and I, it is a back and forth. And I think at this point, I have just decided it, that's what I do. I go over there, I go over there. I try to channel the angry self, sorry for cussing. I try to channel the angry, that persona, that voice, more into action and prose and conversation. Um, and, and so a lot of it, it, it there isn't a, actually a lot of it in my, there is not a lot of it in my poems. But does that answer your question, David? <laughs> Anything, maybe one more? Anybody has been trying to get up the courage to ask a question, but they're not sure? Uh, so thank you for your reading uh, tonight. I grew up in Metro Detroit and have also done some volunteering and work with uh, urban farming in Detroit. And I was just wondering if you could elaborate a little bit more on your experience with that. My only experience with it is the learning about it. I actually haven't done it. So, but I have noticed many urban farms scattered around the city and I am holding myself back from saying, would you elaborate on your experience of urban farming in Detroit? Um, <laughs> I think it is such a, as you can tell from my poem, I think it's a really promising development. You might not, I, I shouldn't assume that you know this, I, I know, but maybe there are people in the room who don't know that the city of Detroit is actually geographically sprawling. It's a very large city. 
even for even when it was at peak population, right? It was a really large city. And so why am I mentioning that? Because there's room. There's there's plenty of room for urban farms and intensive um, residential use and commercial use, right? It isn't isn't it still that way? Oh yeah. Yeah. I thought it was the the comment that you made in your poem about that the one gentleman made about who cares if it's illegal. I just found that funny because that really is the sentiment of everyone down there. Because when you live on a block and every single house on your block is abandoned, you know who really cares who actually owns it. You know you could go and make something nice and clean up the neighborhood a little bit. Why wouldn't you? Make something nice, clean up the neighborhood a little bit. Why wouldn't you? Yeah. Amen. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. <laughs> Thank you. Um, which is not to say that I'm an advocate for you know anarchy and 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 just like taking down the man, but. Yeah, I, and the, I can still picture the scene in the documentary where the man said, totally illegal, but no one complains. Um, there were, it wasn't that they were abandoned houses, there were no houses. So it was, ju it was just grass. It was just grass. And, and you know, that's what, when you tear things down, that's it. things come in and grow, and that's promising. That's the most promising thing in Detroit is to be there in the spring when everything starts to green back up again. It's all over the place. There's turkeys near down t near Tiger State. No, it's not called Tiger Stadium. Comerica Park. There's turkeys. You run into turkeys. I have run into turkeys walking through neighborhoods. So that seems like a really great note to end on, right? The turkeys in Detroit. <laughs> Those of you who are writers, keep writing. I said to the students who took a break with me this afternoon to talk about writing, I said, no, the, the, here are words you are not allowed to say. I'm a bad writer. You're not allowed to say those words to yourself ever. Do not say them. Useless, not true. Let's keep it going. Thank you.